before that, we have one thought uh, uh, that was basically about you know using randomized email addresses for everything in the account. So I mean, uh, if any kind of site or service got hacked, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for them to actually identify your account in there because you know it pretty much looked random. And uh, nice way to do it. Okay, ready for the phone? Yeah. Okay, so we have with us Greg Salabuka from Microsoft Research. From Microsoft or Microsoft Research? Uh, Microsoft Research, yeah. Microsoft Research. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, don't be, uh, you can tell people research, research out, Greg. Oh, well, okay. I mean, I do we some. like researchers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. So I do some of both, uh, you know, some research and some software development too. So. Okay, so give it up for Greg. <laughs> Thanks, Pear. Um, so I'll be talking about password-based encryption today um, with I.O. hardness, um, which is sort of a pretty loose term. could mean, you know, memory hardness, um, but we'll, we'll see what I mean by that um, as I go. So why would you do this? Why, why would you encrypt with a password? Um, I'm not encouraging people to do this more than they already are, you know, um, but Good key management is, is expensive. Um, it's hard to do well. You need a place to uh, store your key, and typically you want to back it up. And um, outside of enterprises, sometimes this isn't justified, right? Um, usually, when you're encrypting with a password, you're encrypting data to yourself. So you're the sort of the sender and the, the recipient. Um, and it's it's overall it's pretty usable, right? Most people can password protect uh, a word file, but if you ask them to encrypt something with PGP, they they might not have such an easy time. So yeah, I'm not arguing we need to do this more often, but if you're going to do it, um, I'll present an idea that might make it more secure. So here are some uh, use cases. Um, so I mentioned Office documents, you know, Word documents. Um, zip files and PFX files can also be password protected. Password managers, you know, encrypt a set of passwords with, with another password. Um, applications uh, that secure data with like DP API um, or, or SQL Cipher are using maybe indirectly but password based encryption. Um, the TarSnap uh, backup uh, software has a, a utility to encrypt files with a password um, using Scrypt. And um, the TrueCrypt uh, disk encryption system uses password-based encryption as well. So, okay, how, how does this work? Um, so I'll start with just a picture of, you know, normal encryption where um, there's a plain text at the top. We have an IV. That's a random value uh, which changes for each encryption operation. Those two together with keys are inputs to the encrypt function which outputs the ciphertext and, and the IV. So that's without a password. Um, with a password, so typically a password and a salt go through a function called a key derivation function, and that's where you get your keys. Uh, and then everything else is, is the same. So there you have it. Um, you know, usually we also want to authenticate our ciphertext using a Mac, so there's actually two keys um, that are derived, and we don't just encrypt, we, we authenticate as well, and there's a tag output at the end. And so some concrete examples here, uh, you might use pbkdf2 for your key derivation. Um, this is an iterated hash function. And uh, AES, CBC, and HMAC are, are sort of examples of encryption and, and authentication algorithms. So the threat model for, for password-based encryption is different um, from you know the, having password hashes in in a in a password file. So with a password file, you know exposure should be rare. Let's hope, um, and it's it's a sort of a security event. Um, whereas with password-based encryption. 
the ciphertext is like sent over email or put on a share somewhere. So the hash um, or the opportunity for a brute force attack is is there right away, sort of by default. Um, you're you're under attack. Um, and changing the password is is ineffective. You know, once the ciphertext is is out there and the attacker sees it, you can't um, change your password um, in order to uh, protect the, the plain text. So um, Jeff gave a nice talk about the, the threat model for password-based encryption uh, last year at Passwords. So in, we'll assume that the attacker gets to see the, the entire output, right? The salt, the IV, the ciphertext, and the tag. Everything that you would need for decryption, the attacker gets to see this. So to do a brute force attack, um, so assume we, we just have the one ciphertext under attack. Um, and we'll also assume that the attacker knows some of the plain text. So typically, you know, these files start with a standard header. So we'll just assume that, that the, the attacker either knows the header or can check that um, when he does a decryption, that the decrypted um, value matches the format, has the correct format. So for each password guess, he derives the candidate keys, does decryption of the first part, so to say the first block of the ciphertext, and compares that um, to the, the known plaintext block. And if they match, then he'll continue decryption, decrypt the whole file, and maybe do some other integrity checks. So the cost for each guess is the work to derive the keys and decrypting one block. Okay, so what if um, the attacker didn't have this shortcut where he could decrypt one block and compare it to something he knows? So if we remove the, if we remove that, it would, you can think of if we had encrypted random data. You know, the attacker would have to process all of it, and then some, you know, check in another way whether this made sense, this decryption made sense. So there, the cost would increase by. Um, so I'm using S for the number of, of, of blocks, but it would increase by, by a factor of S. Um, and if, you know, if it's a large file, this, this could be significant. So as I said, I, I call this I.O. cost so that maybe, it's on a, maybe the file's on a disk if it's really large, or maybe it fits into memory and then it's like a memory cost. Um, but the important thing is that the defender is already doing this work, right? Um, when you have a memory hard KDF, this is sort of purely overhead. It's something that, um, you know, the attacker, or sorry, to the defender, it's purely overhead. It's something he wouldn't normally do. Okay, so how can we do this? How can we force the attacker to process all of the, the ciphertext? Um, and the, the tool is called an all or nothing transform. Um, and so basically, we're going to encode our plain text before we encrypt it. So the encoding is, is randomized. Um, so here we have an encode and a decode function. There's no secrets here. There's no secret key. But the security property we get is that um, if you're given part of an encoded plain text, you can't decode it until you have all of it. So if you only have the first block, um, that doesn't help you. you know, if you're only missing a few bits, you might be able to brute force uh, them. But you know, if you're missing, um, say, more than 128 bits, you won't be able to, to do, do the decode operation. So why would somebody invent such a thing? Um, this is an old idea. There's a good crypto uh, paper from 1997 by Rivest. And his goal was to improve the strength of encryption using export keys, which is sort of similar to password-based encryption. You know, it's something that you don't want to do, but maybe, you, you know, it's, it's your best option or your only option. Um, and export keys and passwords both, you know, they're both weak. They both have, have low entropy. So later it was shown that OAEP, which is a, a padding mode for RSA encryption, is an all-or-nothing transform. Um, and Revest's 
transform is a, a special case of, of OAP. So <clears throat> I just chose to look at OAP um, in this work. So just to review how, how it works, um, our plain text is input. Um, we need two functions, g and h. g takes a random seed. Um, it's you know a short seed and expands it into something like a key stream. So you could think of g being being a yes encounter mode. And then you XOR this with the plain text to encode it. So the encoded plain text is y. And then you need to somehow hide r, right? So that um, y can't be decoded without it. So you hash y and XOR it with r, and then append that to the end. And then, so you can sort of convince yourself that um, that this works. So to decode, um, hash all of y, XOR it with yr to recover r, and then um, recompute g and recover the plain uh, recover the plain text. Okay, so we want to combine these these uh, this encryption with this encoding. Um, so if you start looking at this, there's a kind of a whole bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, I chose three and, and looked at them in detail. And so I'll just kind of informally present them here. And um, you know, I, I wrote this up in a technical report with you know all the details. Um, so I'll, I'll point people to that if if they want more detail. Um, so the first scheme uh, is I'm calling it Mac then encrypt because that's what you do. You you Mac the plain text, then apply the encoding, um, and then encrypt that. The second one is encrypt and Mac. Here we uh, encode, then encrypt, and then compute the Mac. And the third scheme um, is basic. It's the same as the second scheme, but we um, make a special choice for E, which lets us simplify OAP. So uh, I won't I won't present the third scheme at all here, um, but they're they're all in the report. So there's you know, some detailed pseudocode, uh, which I've also implemented to check that, you know, that it's correct. Um, so I'll have the URL for that report uh, at the end of my presentation. Okay, so um, comparing these schemes, uh, AES GCM is what I had in mind as a kind of baseline for authenticated encryption. Uh, like GCM, all three of the new schemes use a single pass for, for encryption, so they can you know, work on a stream of data, which is nice. For decryption, you have to do two passes. Um, and, and I don't see a way to avoid this, because if single pass decryption is possible, then after a constant number of operations, you can get that first plain text block and check whether it, it sort of makes sense. Um, but you know, often we do two passes anyways because we want to first check the Mac before doing any decryption operations. There's a nice blog post by Moxie Marlin Spike where he calls this the cryptographic doom principles. So he he shows some pitfalls of how security fails when you decrypt before authenticating. Uh, and then yeah, another note is that these things are more complicated to implement. Um, you have to implement the all-or-nothing transform, so you have to implement OAEP, which may require you know new primitives that you weren't already using. And to get good performance, you have to interleave encryption with um, the encoding. So this um, to do this on a stream of data, you have to uh, really interleave these things carefully. So now look at some of the costs of the attacks and 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 the costs to the defender, right? Because we're, we're doing more work. Um, this encoding step isn't free uh, and slows down things by you know, roughly a factor of two. So what do we get for this? What does this buy us um, in terms of uh, resistance against brute force attacks? So it's 
kind of easy to do some estimates by, by just counting the CPU costs, you know, the number of block cipher operations. Uh, so that's what I did to get a sense of, um, of the costs. So I'm still using S as the number of, of blocks. And um, so the attacker has to make one pass over the ciphertext in, in schemes two and three, and two passes in scheme one before he can check whether a candidate key is correct. Um, so I, I compared the ratio of, of defender and attacker work. So um, for every you know attacker operation, how many operations does the the defender have to do? So here's a table um, from my write up with some of the numbers. So you can see that the the first scheme has the best ratio, so two meaning um, two defender operations for one attacker operation. Um, and then it goes up to four in scheme two. And then in scheme three, which has this optimization I mentioned, it goes back down to, to three. Um, and they're all constant, you know, whereas in AES, the attacker is doing one operation where the defender does S. So, or sorry, in, in, in AES GCM, that's the case. So that previous table kind of gives you a feel of how the schemes compare to themselves, but um, to look at some more concrete numbers, that'll, that'll give us um, a sense of how much extra work the attacker will have to do. And this varies a lot by the file size, right? That, that parameter S is really important. And also the, the work factor that you're using in your KDF. If that work factor is really large and the file size is really small, then it's effectively, um, the brute force cost is dominated by the, by the KDF and it doesn't really matter what you do on the encryption step. So again, I'll make some, some rough comparisons here by counting the number of, of um, block cipher and, and hash operations. So here's a couple different file sizes. So 100K, a meg, 10 megs, 100 megs. So the number of uh, AES decryption operations is there in the, the second column. So that scales as you would expect. Then I fix the, the number of PBKDF2 iterations to 100,000. So that's about 200,000 uh, hash operations. Um, so then the attacker, you know, without an all or nothing transform, just has to decrypt one block and do the, the PBKDF2 iterations. And then in the next column, you know, it's the sum of the first two columns. So this is what the attacker has to do. And so you can see that it, when you get to about a 10 meg file, it's about four times more work. And so that's probably where it, it starts to make sense with, with these parameters. And of course, this is, you know, it's imprecise. <clears throat> so it's just this kind of back of the envelope. If the KDF, if your work factor changes, so um, what does that mean? Uh, so if we look at 50K iterations for PBKDF2, that's, that's on the bottom of the table, um, then it's about seven times harder with a 10 meg file. So you get more, more benefit. Um, Okay, so going back to my examples, uh, so SQL Cipher, which is an um, encrypted database that I learned about last year at Passwords, it encrypts each page of the database separately, and each page is pretty small. It's 64 AES blocks. So that extra decryption work that you're forcing the, att the attacker to do is probably insignificant relative to the, you know, the KDF cost. For other, you know, for other file types like Office documents and archive files where they, they're usually larger, this probably makes sense and uh, would improve security. But you do have to be careful because, you know, if you're encrypting multiple files with um, the same password, the attacker can pick the, the smallest one to, to do his brute force attack with. Okay, so... Uh, that's all I have.
So just to conclude, you know, password-based encryption is still pretty weak. Don't don't run out and start using it unless you have to. Uh, <laughs> and there are some scenarios where the the third scheme I presented seems to to give an improvement, but overall the idea needs more investigation and um, especially from the attacker perspective. So I did some rough estimates and counted the number of, of crypto operations, but uh, it would be nice to hear from an, an attacker who's familiar with sort of using GPUs as to whether this is, you know, really going to make their life hard or, you know, whether there's an easy way that they can, can deal with um, this extra work. So the tech report is, uh, that's the URL. Um, there's more details there. You can email me or, or catch me later if you have questions. Um, that's it. And questions. Oh, it's Jeff. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Haven't had a question before. Um, could you go back to the slide with your file size table? Um, I was just a little confused about the ratio column. Uh, what's that the ratio between? Um, that's the total attacker with all or nothing transform divided by without. Okay, because um, I think what might also be helpful and useful is to have the ratio between the attacker and the defender. Yeah, I tried to capture that um, over in this table with this yeah. ratio. So I, I, maybe I should have called them different things because two different ratios. But um, sure. okay, yeah. thanks. I, I I now understand the table. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. More questions. Yep. Hi there. So if I understand properly, OAP basically adds an extra factor N to the cost. Um, do you have any recommendations on logical groupings of data, like let's say tarballized output, that would make sense and where this would really shine? Sorry, lo basically, for, um, because the attacker can select the smallest file within the group um, and use that to perform the attack. Um, do you have any recommendations for you know data structures or logical groupings of the data that would make sense with this approach? Ah. Um. So I guess, yeah, you want to find a, a file size that's as large as your application can tolerate, right? And then kind of group things together. So, um, so taking SQL Cipher as an example, the reason they encrypt small pages is so that they can do random access. Um, they could encrypt the whole database, and then the brute force attack cost would go up, but there would be a trade-off in in application performance. So it's a you know, it's going to vary by application. All questions? Okay. Supposedly, there's not a stupid question, but this one may be one. Um, is it my understanding that you're using a, a static, as I call it, a secret key, or one manner of encryption? I, I came in a little bit late on what you're saying. What would happen if you were to use multiple, uh, say, for example, one-time pad uh, secret keys or more than one, if I understood this correctly? H have I confused so, your... So, um, you, like, I, I if, if you did two encryption, like, encrypt first with one algorithm and then with the second? Or or someplace in between, change the, the, uh, the secret key. I mean, multiple secret keys involved. Uh, this is something I don't know if anybody's ever thought of, but uh, yeah. So you can derive, you know, multiple secret keys. They're all coming from the same password. Uh, so. That's what I mean. That one static location. What happens if you're able to change that static element and make it a a uh, one-time pad type of thing? Um, so it, then you have to manage the key, right? So okay. So it's key management then. Yeah, like really the the. The reason people use password-based encryption is, I think, for key management mainly, right? So that okay. you can get a file on any device, and all you need is your password. I'm just, uh, I'm just above that in, in thinking multiple. Uh, I'll call them secret keys, but whatever. Is that not correct? I mean, are, have you been there? Have you been thinking about anything like that? Um, Has that been approached? Has anybody approached you with that kind of an idea? We ought to talk. Outside. Sure, sure, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are other ways to, to encrypt files. Um, 
Well, obviously. And it all just comes down to, to managing the keys. Uh, okay. So. In the management. Well, never mind. We'll talk outside. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So thank you to Greg, and we'll just switch over to Steve Thomas. And one more time, thank you. Greg.